James Lannis, uh, I'm from Autodesk, and we will be talking about what it is Autodesk actually has to do with software as a service. Can you guys hear me? This thing's kind of short. Yes, no, don't care? All right, good. <laughs> All right, so before we dig into this talk about software as a service, we got to make sure we get our buzzwords out of the way. Um, there's been a lot of names for this whole concept over the years. Um, probably heard of ASP being one of those, you know, back in the days when ISP was one of the big words that we like to kick around. Um, people kind of co-opted that and say, oh, we're not just going to provide internet, we're going to provide applications. Uh, so you had companies that were jumping on this bandwagon calling themselves ASPs. You know, a lot of the CRM apps um, in, the, in the old days uh, were doing that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, basically companies providing software on the internet, you know, that's, that's the main theme here. Uh, we had companies calling their software on demand, and this is something that Autodesk has done. Uh, we've been kind of guilty of that. We take, oh, well, we've got this product that you're supposed to install on your server. Well, let's just host that, and we'll call it on demand. You know, it's, it's the same exact thing. You know, this whole Web 2.0 concept, I don't know if anyone even really knows what that means at this point. Um, but I, I think that kind of has to do with software as a service. Uh, I don't know. Um, but I, I think the best way to, to really talk about software as a service and understand what it means is just give some examples. So Salesforce, I think, is kind of the quintessential example that everybody knows, and I think pretty much everybody uses it at this point. They've kind of submarined themselves into pretty much every company doing pretty much everything that there is that's out there. But they don't sell you their software. They sell you a service, right? You don't buy a copy of Salesforce. You buy a license for users to log into Salesforce, right? So they're hosting your data. They're granting you access to their applications. That's the idea behind software as a service. Now, where it really starts getting interesting is when everybody else starts jumping on this bandwagon, right? So how many of you have seen Photoshop Express? Okay, a few of you. Basic concept is everyone's aware of Photoshop, you know, one of the most heavily pirated pieces of software out there, right? <laughs> so th how does Adobe solve that problem? You know, maybe, maybe this whole idea of software as a service is gonna help us out, right? But th this idea of Photoshop Express, you go to a website and you're using Photoshop. You're not, you know, downloading your crack. You're not, you know, paying your $5,000. You're going to a website and using Photoshop features to edit your photos. Look at Google. I mean, they're kind of, you know, quintessential example of submarining. You know, you talk about software as a service. Almost everything that they're doing now is an example of software as a service. You know, all of us have Gmail accounts at this point. That is software as a service. It's breaking the traditional email model where, oh, webmail, that's, that's an application service provider. Well, really, it's just, you know, webmail software as a service. But then you, you move on to the other stuff that's just tabs right now in your Gmail client or, you know, somewhere in your iGoogle interface. Google Docs, it's Word for the web. It's Word as a service. Um, Google Spreadsheets, Excel as a service, right? Um, who knows what else Google's gonna do, you know? Their goal, obviously, is total information awareness. So, you know, what is the next thing that Google is going to tune into service? I have no idea. <laughs> so where does Autodesk fit into this whole picture? You know, you think of Autodesk, and maybe you don't even know what we do. Or maybe you think of AutoCAD. What does that have to do with a service, or Maya, or any of these, these sort of box products? You know, traditionally, there's no security model for a box product, right? What, is it, what does it mean? to make security on a, a desktop app that you're going to install. You know, you don't want someone to pirate it. Uh, what else do you really care about? Not a whole lot, right? Um, so when you, when you think about Autodesk, you don't normally think about these kind of things. But uh, the reason I joined Autodesk, and this was about uh, a year ago at this point, was that they're, they're totally bought into this whole idea of software as a service. And the group that I'm working in now, we're already operating SaaS applications. They're not a huge part of our business. Most of you would never hear of them because, you know, how many people in here are in the construction industry? Nobody, right? You know, construction industry, we're still working on slide rules most of the time. It's very hard to convince people to use technology. Um, so the reality is, you know, th when we're making this transition, it's, it's not something you normally think of Autodesk as doing, but uh, there's a whole lot of cool products that we've got going on, and you know, this isn't a sales pitch because I don't think anyone here is in the position to buy Autodesk stuff anyway. But um, you know, we're, we're doing things like 
making grid computing environments to, to do uh, rendering in 3D in real time so you can walk through somebody's building. You know, we're looking at doing the same thing that Adobe is doing. And you know, we have this kind of, we're not me tooing Adobe uh, kind of mentality at, at Autodesk sometimes, which is kind of weird that we see them as a competitor. Um, but in the technology space, there's a lot of things where we overlap. You know, we own Maya, which is a 3D rendering uh, <coughs> software. All those kind of things, we're thinking about turning those into a service. And one of the prime motivations there, again, is this idea of piracy, where what, what is one of our biggest challenges? Well, somebody can just take AutoCAD and pirate it to their heart's content. But when you, when you think about putting AutoCAD on the web, how are you going to pirate that? You know, we'll talk about some of the advantages to that, that whole process. But this idea of a grid computing, you know, 3D rendering modeling system, you know, taking your, auto, your AutoCAD drawings and then all the other businesses that Autodesk has acquired doing things like um, this company called Green Building Studio, which what it what allows you to do is take a Revit drawing, plug it into this, this basically web service, and what it does is spit back your, your green kind of um, profile. So we got in kind of trouble because we were measuring the green profile of a building in Hummer H3s. That was our unit of, like, greenness. <laughs> so you, you'd, you'd upload your, your drawing, and you'd get back a measurement of how much carbon your building was using in terms of Hummer H3. So we had to kind of change our unit. But uh, all these kind of these cool ideas where you're taking all these different services that are built around the idea of a building drawing or a building plan or a, you know, a 3D model. Um, welding all those web services together, suddenly you're blurring the line between, all right, well, I've got Revit, but I've got a plugin that talks to a web service. Is that software as a service now? I don't know. What happens if I take all the other functionality in Revit and put that on the web? So that's kind of where we're at right now. We're in this idea of let's do this and how is that going to work? Um, so that's why I'm excited to be involved in that whole process. And that's why I'm going to be talking about why software as a service matters. So hopefully that answers your question about what's Autodesk doing here. <laughs> so. Um, to kind of put this whole thing into perspective, when I was building this presentation, uh, I came to a realization that I could probably sum everything up in about 30 seconds. You know, I could have walked in and said, software as a service is nothing new. Whatever you're doing to secure your apps before, you got to do the same thing, right? And then I could just walk off. Um, but, you know, I wanted to make sure you guys get your money's worth. So, um, giving a little background of what that actually means and why this stuff isn't new, uh, using a quote here from the dudes at Sun, and if you look at this kind of at the surface, do you think they were, were, were trying to sell Sun boxes this way? Not really, I mean, they weren't, they weren't making network hardware. Um, but the idea that information or processing exists in the grid, it doesn't exist on the client, um, that's something we kind of had to learn the hard way. So there's this whole pendulum swing that he's talking about where we had a mainframe infrastructure where we had very dumb clients we moved into, what happens if we put everything on the client? You know, we've got all this general purpose hardware. What, why not use it? And then we realized all the reasons why that should be the case. And now we're kind of swinging back. So over this period of 30 years, and I figured I'd you know, just do a quick back of the envelope calculation and see what kind of pendulum we were talking about here. Um, works out to be about 900 light years. So you know, size doesn't matter, obviously. But um, it doesn't really make sense either because we're talking about, you know, Earth gravity, and you can't really fit a pendulum that size in there. But anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> so much for the only goal of being funny, <laughs> distracting you from the fact that I have no content. <laughs> so what, it, what does this mean? What has this pendulum swing done? So let's talk about the old days and the green screens, right? We had terminals daisy-chained up to our mainframes, there was no processing being done whatsoever on the client. You know, you entered some data, you viewed some data, your, your, your client was very thin, right? So what does that mean in the modern world? Well, we've got web browsers, right? But uh, w what is that going to be in the SaaS model that we're looking at? Let's say this pendulum swings all the way back to the mainframe world that we were used to. So you've got your traditional web, web application, right, where it's just HTML, and then you've got Ajax, you've got all that kind of stuff, which isn't taking advantage of any sort of additional technologies that are out there. Um, but, but there are a lot of environments that are being built specifically for this idea of, you know, rich internet applications. You know, that's kind of, you know, another buzzword that I forgot to include on my buzzword compliance sheet. Um, 
what does that mean? What does it mean to have a rich internet application? Well, it basically means that you're moving back towards that mainframe environment where you're controlling everything about the user interaction, um, including the environment that they're viewing it in. So there's a lot of competing technologies out there um, that are they're kind of vying for this control over what's going to be the platform that we build the client environment in and you know some of the server-side components. So Adobe has Air, which is kind of an extension of Flex, or Flex and Flash, Flex and Flesh, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is their answer to that problem. Uh, Microsoft is doing the Me Too and, and coming out with Silverlight. Um, there's some betas out there right now. Um, pretty sure this is the route that we're going to end up going just because we're a Microsoft shop. Um, but again, it's the same kind of idea where you're, you're packaging up the, the ideas behind the Ajax uh, model and, and, and providing a platform that, that abstracts that away from the developer. Same thing with Google Gears, right? You know, they're, they're providing a framework to use Ajax in this case uh, so that you don't have to worry about the implementation details. You know, how is IE going to handle this particular control? How, how am I going to display data on a million different browsers? All you care about is how am I giving data to the client and getting information back, right? So um, what's the trend here going to be? Well, you know, we're, again, we're not in green screen territory, right? We're still running general purpose hardware, general purpose operating systems, general purpose browsers to some extent. You know, if we had actually gotten to find out, you know, what, what Jer and Arsnake were going to talk about, you know, it's just one more example of, of why a general purpose browser is failing us from a security perspective, right? Because you, you can't trust the application if you don't trust the technology, and we can't trust the browser right now, right? So what is the ultimate goal behind what Google is doing? You know, are they trying to replace the browser plus general purpose hardware with the browser as an OS? You know, we, we could be back in the total twilight zone where we're doing the opposite of what Microsoft was doing, where they got in trouble for bundling the browser and the OS well, what happens now if the browser is the OS? You know, what's, what's that going to mean for technology as we know it? So you know, we're kind of back to what, what is Google going to be doing to the software as a service space? Uh, it's a good thing Arsenic isn't here, by the way. I'm sure he, he's rolling in his seat on the plane. Um, <laughs> So, all right, so that's the client environment, right? So looking at the mainframe environment, what, what is our analogy to the mainframe environment? Where's the pendulum going to swing there? Well, our, our first thought might be to look at our data centers and see, well, we've got this centralization of, of hardware, or you know, how are people running SaaS applications now? Well, it's, it's centralized and hosted, but how are we doing on, on distributing that environment? Um, you know, it, do we have something that's analogous to a mainframe. And the reality is that it, we're, we're, we've got this whole network infrastructure now, which much like the browser, much like the OS, it's general purpose. We've got all kinds of traffic on it. It's not designated specifically for it. This is our application, and all it does is talk to our client. Um, so, you know, looking at this kind of server environment, is that the answer to the mainframe? I don't think it is. I, I think what we're going to end up with is that's this idea of cloud computing is going to be our mainframe environment. This is kind of my little nod to application security Nintendo with the, the, uh, <laughs> the Super Mario clouds here. Um, <laughs> so why do I think that this is the ultimate uh, goal? We'll talk a little bit about what cloud computing models that are out there right now, right? So we talked about Salesforce as, as being, you know, when people think of SaaS, natural tendency is think of Salesforce.com. Well, what they're doing is they have this, this concept of app exchange. So it's not just a SaaS application, it's a platform. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of applications written to plug in to salesforce.com. So it's not just an application, it's an application framework, right? And, and, and what do you think about when you think about how that works? Is it, are you uploading it to a server? Or no, you're up uploading it to a, an infrastructure. It's a complete infrastructure that's supporting um, your, your sort of server side or your mainframe environment. Uh, Amazon, EC2. So, you know, the general thinking right now is that you shouldn't really use this as your application environment. It's sort of like a giant slash temp directory at this point. Um, <laughs> so we, we're obviously not there yet in terms of creating a true, robust, scalable environment. Um, but everybody is, is getting into the space, right? Like Microsoft is, is talking about grid computing already. 
um, Google has this app engine, right? So there's been a lot of um, talk about how that's going to work. Um, you know, there's the Amazon stuff. I mean, it's really pretty cool, right? If you're if you're kind of if you're not one of the big guys, basically what you do is you write your app, you spin up a, a VM or any number of VMs. Basically, you're giving them here's my app, you run it for me, you handle my data, all that kind of stuff. It's it's a really cool concept, and the reason why I think it's mainframe is that their cost model is pay per cycle, right? That's exactly how it was back in the old mainframe days where you paid for the amount of CPU time you use. So, you know, with EC2, if you're, if you're one of the little guys, you know, you're not paying for a huge hardware infrastructure. You're paying per cycle. So if you have a million users, Amazon's gonna spin up enough CPUs so that they can support your app. If you've got two users, they're not gonna charge you for eight million servers. They're gonna spin up one VM and you're going to run off of that. So it's, it's an interesting model. It, it makes total sense. Um, but when you think about what that means for an arbitrary infrastructure, you know, we're, we're moving definitely away from this idea of every single application has a dedicated architecture, right? We're, we're moving to a model where we kind of have the network is the computer. We have hundreds of machines out there, general purpose hardware, running a VM, you know, maybe we have a sort of macro network, you know, kind of hypervisor. You know, it's a really kind of interesting model, and we're nowhere near it, but I think that's where it's going to go, right? So obviously with, you know, Google getting into this whole space, you know, it's, it's really kind of amazing how much they're behind the scenes of all this. Like every time I was looking into a specific aspect of this, it's just like, oh, Google's already here. They're already doing it. Um, so, you know, they're pretty smart people, obviously. It's, I, I think it, it definitely means something that there are so much investment into this idea of software as a service. So what's some good stuff about the, the, the new model? Like, you're thinking about that distributed architecture, the network is the computer, how do you take down a, a network fabric? How do, you, how do you take it out? You know, you could go and plug a mainframe, right? You can't unplug the entire network, hopefully. So, you know, traditional weapons that we use to try to attack systems, if you're, you're in this kind of general purpose um, network-based architecture, old school weapons are, are useless. So it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a nice benefit, right? You know, you take out one or two nodes of EC2, it doesn't matter. You've got six million other nodes p picking up right where you left off. You know, you've got your data center in Houston, you know, you're right in the path of a hurricane. Who cares? You know, you've got data centers around the world, around, you know, basically in every location that computers are running, that kind of model, you know, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of intuitive, right, that that's, that's how it should be. You know, your application shouldn't depend on a single, you know, data center point of failure. Uh, we were looking at what Rackspace is doing. Uh, have anybody, has anyone seen that, that ICE uh, truck that Rackable is making? It's basically a data center in a semi-rig. So you drive it around wherever the power is cheapest and the network's cheapest, right? Same kind of concept, you know, ultimately, you know, we're going to move wherever the hosting is cheapest and where the support of the technology is cheapest. So as this pendulum has been swinging back and forth, you know, think about what, what we had in terms of security in the mainframe days. You know, was there such thing as a buffer overflow? What were our security concerns in the mainframe days? We didn't really have any, right? And when you think about doing a mainframe assessment, what you're worried about is all your middleware, because that's where we started doing things wrong. So the reason why you can't just come in and say, this is everything that we're already doing, so just secure it the way that you've always done it, is because history repeats itself, right? We want to make sure that we're not making the same mistakes when we build this architecture right this time. So looking at the, some of the things that we've kind of accumulated, you know, these barnacles that have attached themselves to our pendulum, what, what's gone wrong? since we moved away from mainframe and tried to go to general purpose computing. So one, th one main problem is that we, we got away from the, the boundary separation between data and functionality, right? So on the mainframe, code didn't, or data didn't execute. And that's, that's the fundamental problem behind almost every single application security vulnerability that you could even talk about as being high risk, right? Original buffer overflow, you know, it's data being interpreted as functional code. Cross-site scripting, SQL injection, all of those are fundamentally, you know, problems that resulted from blurring the boundary between data and, and functionality. So when we're building our software as a surface architecture, 
obviously something that we've got to keep in mind. Uh, but, you know, that's just one example of, of the things that started going wrong when we decided that, hey, we can do all this cool stuff on the client side. So, all, you know, all those things are going to be things that we had to think about when we move back to the true sort of mainframe environment. You know, if we're going to go back that direction, let's make sure we remember what was good about it. So um, I think everybody at this point has at least heard the idea of the death as a perimeter. I don't know if any of us have fully let go of that since you know, most of us in this room have been doing this for a long time. And that's how we were, that's how we were raised, right? We were raised on the perimeter. You know, build, build your firewall defense. Build up you know, a us versus them mentality. Build up this idea of there is an inside and an outside. Um, and that's, it has to go away. It just there's no way that you can accommodate that, even in today's environment, let alone when we move to the SaaS kind of platform. So some of the interesting things about SaaS, um, in terms of you know, ramming home the idea that the, the perimeter is dead, you think about how SaaS is acquired. So think about how, how people go out and, and buy a subscription to salesforce.com, for instance. You know, is it IT that's, that's recognizing this business need? No, IT has always been sort of like a gate because they're, they're in line with the purchasing process. You know, you gotta buy a piece of software, you gotta buy it through IT. But one of the interesting things that Salesforce has seen happen is that you know, HR departments or business units will go out and, and find these, these SaaS platforms and say, hey, this will fit our business need. We don't need to go through IT because it's a subscription service. We don't need to install it on our machines. We don't have any of the traditional controls there. So companies are finding themselves owning subscriptions to these services and data are being put out on the web, right? So, you know, suddenly IT security comes to this problem and says, you know, what happened to our perimeter? Why, why, is, why are data being pushed through our firewall on port 80 outside of our printer? We have no control over it. You know, it's a great example of how SaaS just totally breaks down that whole model. You think about how you build a perimeter about a SaaS application itself, how do you even create a threat model for that? You know, where, where do you draw the trust boundaries on a SaaS application? Do you draw it around the whole thing? Do you draw it around just the client um, and, and try to focus on that? Do you draw it around you know, the grid? <laughs> how do you draw a, a trust boundary around grid computing? It's, it's, again, we had to totally change the way that we're thinking about security um, already, and then SaaS is just you know, kind of the, the final nail in that coffin in terms of you know, how do we think about security from an us versus them inside outside perimeter based perspective. So I talked a little bit before about um, some of the, you know, another benefit of the idea of, of making a box product into a SaaS product. So th this whole idea of copyright protection and, and you know, anti-piracy and all of that, it, I just, I find it hilarious and it's, it's fundamentally impossible to protect client-side code running on a general purpose computer. And, and the fact that there's whole industries sprung up around the idea of you know, protecting you know, data on the client side you know, without quantum encryption, obviously, is, I mean, it, it's crazy. It's, it's trying to stuff the genie back in the bottle. And the cool thing about SaaS is it, it totally steps around that whole problem. I mean, yeah, there's, there's going to be some blurring where, okay, what happens if you are putting Photoshop on the web, but all you're doing is just creating a JavaScript version of Photoshop. Well, yeah, somebody could just pull down your JavaScript code and then you know, repurpose it to run it on their own machine. But the reality is that a lot of the code is actually going to be pushed back into the cloud so that in order to pirate the service, you'd have to get access to the source or find some way to get into the cloud and, and get the functional, uh, you know, functional code that way. So this idea of wholesale drop and drop ship of pirated software, just it won't exist anymore, right? Because you're not buying the software, you're buying a service which includes you know, data storage and all these additional features. So you're de you know, to some extent you're decoupling the separation between functionality and data, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, we're, we're, we, can, we, we can't do that without maintaining the separation that we talked about before. So it's another really interesting aspect of SaaS, I think it, it's, um, you know, it's one of the reasons that I think Autodesk has moved to that uh, model as well, because AutoCAD is also one of the most pirated applications out there, uh, simply because it is so expensive. 
So the idea of data security, again, we talked about how the perimeter is dead, but the idea of data security absolutely isn't dead. You know, otherwise none of us would have jobs anymore. Um, you know, there may be a trend toward more openness. You know, maybe the whole industry around selling data crashes because everybody has it at some point. Um, maybe the value of data gets driven down to a point where this doesn't matter. I severely doubt it. Um, that's, that's one thing that people are going to be holding on to pretty tightly, and I don't think it's going to go away. So how do, you, how do you maintain confidentiality of data in a SaaS model? So again, when you think about how the perimeter is dead and, and how you can't define a trust boundary around grid computing, this becomes a really challenging question. So when you think about, well, how do you secure data? You know, think about your Gmail account, for instance. You know, your email isn't encrypted on Google's servers. They're using their technology to search it and you know, sell you new and better stuff based on your unencrypted email, right? Um, but what if you don't want it to be that way? What if you, you want to use a software as a service product, but you don't want them looking at your data? How do you solve that problem? It's, it's a really challenging question. Um, a couple ways to approach it. I mean, you could, you could manage your key escrow on the client side, right? So encrypt your data before you upload it. You have a lot of disadvantages there in that, you know, the software can't operate on your data uh, on the server side, you know, other than doing replication and various, you know, sort of data maintenance tasks. But if you're trying to, like, do rapid sort, rapid search, you can't do that without unencrypted data, right? So fundamentally, you know, you're, you're kind of breaking the model of software as a service if you want to escrow your keys on the client side. And, you know, most customers, they come to a SaaS platform because they don't want to do any of that. So forcing them to do key escrow, suddenly, you know, you're giving some responsibility for the data maintenance to your client. You know, where is the legal boundary when they lose their keys and you can't recover their data? You know, <laughs> whether, whether you're liable or not, you're going to get sued. <laughs> So that would, be a, that would be one approach, and it, even that is challenging, right? So how do you convince somebody that, you know, in the application you're providing a way to give them the keys, you're not just grabbing the private key using your client-side code and pulling that to the server side to encrypt the data? You know, you, you might have a whole industry springing up around verifying the fact that keys are not leaking. Um, that, but I think there are other solutions to this, right? So is everyone familiar with Freenet? Anyone? Bueller? Couple people, um, <laughs> so I, you know, I guess that means that you're all above board citizens, maybe, since there's mostly illegal uses for Freenet. But so, if you're familiar with the architecture of Freenet, right? Like, if you're running a Freenet node, you don't have access to Freenet node data. You know, it's the way it's architected is that um, you know the keys are distributed in such a way that you don't have all of a piece of data, you don't have unencrypted data. So any one compromise of any one node of Freenet doesn't give you anything. So that same kind of concept you can apply to the SaaS infrastructure, right? So when you're dealing with grid computing, grid storage, you want replication, you want all those kind of things happening. Um, so you're going to have to extend that, that kind of Freenet protocol, if you will, uh, to, to give you, you know, more enterprise uh, class support. But that, that same kind of concept can help uh, deal with your threat model of, well, I don't trust my ISP, or I don't trust 15 of the 600 um, providers that are giving me, you know, data and, and processor cycles. So those kind of things, I think, are, are going to be really interesting to see how that problem is solved, and how do I guarantee confidentiality if there's so many different components of the application that I don't control and, you know, I, I can't trust um, the, the supporters of. So those are, those are kind of some of the benefits and challenges. Um, and, it, and the reason why, again, th that I'm here and that I'm talking about this is because I think this platform, it makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons, and it's really where the trend is going, right? The pendulum is swinging back. So we can talk all day about you know, what the problems are, but fundamentally, we need to work on solving them, right? And, and these problems we're working on solving for you know, web services or traditional web apps um, already how do, we, how do we take some of those efforts and, and not have every single person or every single company in this business reinventing the wheel on how to do this stuff right? So what do we have to do to secure a SaaS platform? So the first thing is to secure the platform itself. When I talk about platform, what I'm talking about is the kind of grid, it, you know, the analogy is the mainframe, right? How do you secure the server side, if you will, of the platform? 
So we talked about some of the things you have to do there. You have to you know, figure out a confidentiality model, uh, integrity obviously being part of that. Um, availability, I think, comes with it. So that's, that's a problem I don't think we have to worry about. But how do you, how do you rethink a threat model throwing away the traditional perimeter security um, you know, of us versus them, inside, outside, um, uh, perimeter model that, that we used to have? How do we rethink that security strategy so that we come up with something that's workable? So that's, uh, that's a pretty easy task, right? I'm sure we can you know, crank that out in a couple months. How do you secure the infrastructure? That's something we haven't talked about yet. You know, we, we talked about in the old mainframe world how your, your infrastructure, your, your network was daisy chain RS32 cables or whatever it was, a bunch of serial cables lined up. But what's your security model there? Well, somebody physically comes into your building, you know, plugs into your network or snips, snips some cables that doesn't exist anymore, right? You know, we, we're dealing with infrastructure that still has fundamental problems. You know, Comiskey's research is just one example of all the fundamental design problems around TCP IP or any of the protocols that we have to even handle our communication. So we're talking about connecting our client and our server. That's not an easy problem to fix either. You know, what are the challenges to the infrastructure now that, that we're going to have to face to, to figure out this whole SaaS platform security problem? So, you know, a couple months there, you know, we're looking at maybe Q1 of 09. I'm sure that's pretty realistic. How do you secure the client? Uh, again, this whole idea that we're running on general purpose hardware, from the right threat model, you look at this problem and it's unsolvable. If you're running general purpose code and you don't control the client, there is no way that you can guarantee client side security. So how do you solve that problem? Well, you got to take away the general purpose hardware. Uh, you know, how do you take away the baby um, from people now that they have, you know, ubiquitous access to anything that they want to do? Um, I think it, I think it, it's going to be a very long process before we're back to web on a device, right? You know, we've got cell phones that are running a web browser, but we're still, for in all intents and purposes, running a general purpose OS. So how do we create a client environment? that we know is secure. Now, that's not an easy problem either. Um, again, we keep seeing Google pop up here. One of the goals, I think, behind Google Gears, if you read their little cartoon, uh, is, is partially solving that problem. Is we've got fundamental design issues in all the major browsers that are out there. And I think Chrome solved some of them, but the reality is that it's still running on general purpose hardware. And I think we need to think about how we solve that problem as well. So. Getting everybody to change the way they browse the web, um, probably another nine months after that. So what do you think, like maybe a year we can figure out how to make money off of this thing securely? So this is the part where we start begging, right? So um, Autodesk, big company, Adobe, big company, but this is a huge, huge problem. And it's not something that's going to get solved by one or two companies that are out there. Um, these, you know, you guys in the room, you guys are industry experts. Um, we need to get together and solve this problem together, right? This is something that isn't just going to be a unilateral effort. And it's not something we'd want to be a unilateral effort because we don't want, you know, to be saddled with a design that came out of, you know, one of the big guys just because they are the big guy. We want something that's universal and accessible. So some of the things that I think, um, you know, would make sense for this idea of solving the, the, the problem is, you know, break it down in, into, into more manageable projects. You know, we're not going to solve the client environment right away, but you know maybe we can create some criteria around what does a browser-based green screen look like. You know, there's there's a hundred different little projects that we can start getting some good dialogue about, get some real you know solid information, some solid documentation about how do we do this thing right if we're going to do it. You know, maybe we go to an RFC model, maybe we redesign the internet from the ground up. You know, I don't know. Um, again, this, is, this stuff is pretty new. Um, it's pretty new to me also. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that are doing this stuff. So I've got a URL up here, sassecure.com. It's, it's basically three or four guys right now <laughs> with a website with nothing on it. So don't visit it. Don't go out there. Uh, it kind of looks like it was hacked already, even though that's just our kind of boiler, boilerplate content. But that, uh, the goal there is, you know, you know, Joe White is in the audience. He's one of the guys working on it. Roby Papp has helped um, put some of this stuff together. Um, a lot of us in the Bay Area, but again, this is, I think this is a, it's a global problem. Um, you know, you think about SaaS platforms right now, 
uh, Autodesk has this problem too. You know, we have global customers with global concerns. You know, we, we sell uh, software as a service to China, but they don't want their data leaving China. You know, how do you create a SaaS infrastructure that's region or country aware? How do you prevent selling software to Cuba? How do you, how do, you do all, all this kind of, um, you know, traditional box product processes in a SaaS environment? These are the problems that we're trying to solve, and I think this open model has been great for security. You know, I think we've made significant projects in application security in the OWASP or open format. The same exact philosophy behind SaaS Secure. So we want to look at software as a service security from a community perspective, develop community-based documents and resources on how to do this stuff right and really steer the direction of this SaaS beast toward something that we can all live with. So that's, uh, that's, that's my begging um, on behalf of Autodesk as well as the entire SaaS industry. Is if you think you can contribute or you like the ideas or you think it's fun, I think this stuff is great, um, volunteer to, to help contribute to this stuff. So that's it. That's what I got. Any heckling? <laughs> Please be heckling. You got a question? Uh -huh. How do you transmit customer confidential information over the internet? And those are specific requirements you need to meet in order to be secure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, that's one of the reasons why I said that you know I could come in and do this presentation in 30 seconds. This is nothing new. You know, you're not walking away from your compliance requirements. You're not walking away from all the other problems that we have. So your point is great in that I think as a customer of SaaS, you don't even have to be a purveyor of SaaS, but as a customer, you're helping to drive the requirements for how this infrastructure looks, right? So, you know, if you're looking for a SaaS 70 on, you know, what are your what, what are your controls around maintaining your SaaS environment? Or if you, you know, if you're maintaining GLBA data or any of that kind of stuff, you know, absolutely all of those compliance concerns have to enter into the, the infrastructure design. It's a good point. Come on, guys. Give it back to me.